Hi, hello, and uh, welcome to this, the first of our live online Q&As uh, from Point Blank uh, Music School in London. Uh, welcome along. Uh, my name's David. I deal with uh, student admissions and course advice and just making sure that um, you guys know everything you need to know about what we do. Uh, and this is Danny, uh, who you might have seen before if you've watched some of the videos on our YouTube channel. Uh, he's the lead course developer here, so he's the brains behind a lot of the um, material that you see on the courses. Um, if you're not familiar with Point Blank and what we do, um, as I mentioned, we're a music school, we're based in London, we offer courses uh, here at our studios, um, but we also offer online courses, and that's what we're here to uh, introduce you to today. So the idea is to give you a kind of a clearer insight into how those courses work, what you can expect when you enrol, um, what they're all about, essentially. Um, so you'll find some useful information on the website in terms of um, you know, how they work and how you can get involved. Um, the courses tend to run between four and 12 weeks. Um, and the idea is that um, you're getting one-to-one -one tuition and training from someone who's a professional music producer. That's what we do here at the school in London. And that's what we've tried to, to replicate with the online courses. Um, now, the question that I get asked all the time is, how does that work? You know, uh, if I'm learning online, then uh, how do I interact with the tutor? How does the teaching work? So that's what we're going to try and show you a little bit of today. We'll show you some of the course materials, some of the um, you know, content that you can expect to find on the course. And also, we'll try and um, show you behind the scenes a little bit um, so that you know what to expect on the course. So there's some video content on the website, as I said, that gives you a bit of an explanation about um, how online learning works. But in a nutshell, this is how it works. Once you enrol for a course, you've got access to a, a secure area on our website, which is your virtual classroom, if you like. Uh, and that's where you'll access your course materials. Those materials are available to you 24 seven. So you can log in and learn and uh, check out those materials whenever you like. There's no sort of fixed times that you have to be online, uh, which is great because it means that we've got students all over the world and it means that you can interact with students all over the world and share ideas and talk about the topics and the music that you're excited about. Um, so that's the first thing. There's no sort of um, really strict timetable. You can log in and learn whenever you like. Uh, the second thing is um, there's a live masterclass each week so uh, usually on a Thursday, your tutor uh, will be live online and he'll do a broadcast very much like this one where he'll kind of guide you through a, a track um, or a technique and just kind of break down some of the topics and the, uh, the techniques that we've been looking at in the class that week. Um, so obviously those are really useful because it's a chance for you guys to get an insight into how a track's put together and how a professional producer works. Uh, and that's, that's what we're all about. So, I think Danny will probably guide you through some of that um, material in a little while. So we'll give you a flavour of how one of those live masterclasses might work. Um, the bit that really kind of blows people's minds is the fact that at the end of each week, you can submit one of your tracks that you've been working on in Ableton or Logic or Cubase or whatever your software is um, and get some one-to-one -one feedback from one of the team of pro producers that works here. Um, so yeah, you've been working away all week in your home studio, you've got something that you're reasonably happy with, you upload it to the site, and then what you get back within a couple of days is um, a one-to-one -one tutorial. So what you're seeing on screen is your track, your project uh, in Logic or Ableton or wherever your software is, but what you're hearing is a voiceover from your tutor and you're seeing all of his mouse movements uh, as he guides you through your track and explains what you're doing well uh, and maybe some of the areas where you can improve. So it's pretty much like sitting in a room with a pro producer uh, and getting that kind of one-to-one -one tuition that we do here in London, but from the comfort of your own home studio. Uh, and as you can imagine, once, once you've tried it, people absolutely love it because um, it's, it's feedback on your track. Uh, so it's not just like uh, you know generic kind of material that you know, maybe you can find on YouTube. It's actually based around your work, your sound, uh, your kind of creativity. Um, and there's no one else really doing it. 
So, you know, if that sounds appealing and like something that would benefit your music, um, then yeah, you're in the right place. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I guess I'll pass you over to Danny now and he can tell you a bit more about what he's going to show you. Um, we're here for the next hour or so. So um, this is all about kind of giving you the information that you need. If you've got any questions about uh, how the courses work, what course would maybe be right for you, um, you know, any questions about what we can offer and how we can help you to develop your music, um, you know, fire away and I'll do my best to, to answer them for you. Um, Danny's a technical expert, so if you've got any technical questions, he'll maybe try and handle those during the, uh, some of the tutorial content. But uh, yeah, we'd love to hear from you. So, you know, get in touch and um, we'll do our best to help. Danny. So I'm the course developer and tutor here at Point Blank. And basically the master classes that David was talking about are these kind of sessions where we have a streaming desktop. You can see what's going on on the computer screen and we can basically answer questions in real time. You guys will be typing questions on the, the text input device. And then someone like myself will get back and we'll be responding to your questions. And we can literally do the demonstrations on the computer screen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you on a little bit of a, a tour of an example project, which is actually a release tune. This is a track that I put out on uh, sulfuric tracks. And so basically we're going to do a little bit of an overview. I'm going to cover some of the things that are in the project and I can take some questions about any of the aspects that you're interested in. So what I'll do first of all is I'll do a little bit of a playthrough and you can imagine that this is like the last week of your four week course, for example, if you're doing a pro producer course, where we're looking at the kind of the finished structure, the, the kind of end result and uh, really just doing an overview and making sure that the track flows from beginning to end really nicely, that the mix down is sounding good, all of these different aspects are sorted out. So a lot of the tutors would bring in one of their tunes on that last week on the masterclass to show you how a professional person would actually you know, do all of the things that you're doing in the, in the lessons that you're working through. So I'm going to play this from the beginning and uh, I'll go through the elements. I'll start highlighting certain aspects of the actual project. So I'm going to play from the top. So I'm going to break it down into the individual sections. I'm going to zoom in on a, a section here so you can see what's happening. So the elements that I've got at the moment, there is it's actually a drum loop. And uh, for those of you guys who've been following the stuff that I do on Twitter and on my Facebook page, one of the things that I brought up was that in recent months I got a bit lazy and uh, I started you know, using things like loops. Now the loop isn't exactly how it was when I originally found it. What I did was I, I cut it up, processed it and, and dealt with it and then I bounced it out. So what you're actually seeing is the end result of that processing. So that's layered with a couple of elements. Let's take it back to the beginning. So we've got the drum loop. We've also got a clap, which has got basically some effects going on. This is being sent through to one of my effects chains. This is a custom Ableton instrument rack. Well, this is a, an effects rack. And what I've got is two instances of the Korg MDEX effect. And I'm a big fan of the Korg Legacy Bundle. You know, this is something that I bought a while ago. And um, the effects devices in there I really like. So I'm going to bring up what I've got here. These two effects, I've got a reverb with a long tail. And then after that, I've got here a phaser. So the reverb is creating the space, but then the phaser is creating the movement on top of that. So they're running in series, reverb first, then we've got the phaser after, which is creating a nice kind of spacey texture. I don't know if you can hear that. I've got to have this quite low at the moment because we don't want it to be feeding back. But there's this kind of movement on the actual, uh, the, the shape of the sound. So if I take this off, that's the clap on its own. And then that's going through the effect now. So it adds a nice movement throughout the track. It's quite subtle. Um, so it means that things aren't too static. Back to the beginning. So we've also got a snare. This is uh, a synthesizer called Silent. And basically that's just 
It's just a noise oscillator and also a tone combined together to create that snare. And that's actually a preset. All I've done is I've played it on a specific note and that's being layered with the other elements. A shaker loop. So that's a real shaker. You know, I mean, I can program good shakers, but this is one of those tunes that um, it was done at speed. You know, the original idea actually took me about an hour and a half. And um, so I was really just throwing things down, trying to get stuff up and running quickly. Right, the bass, which is very distinctive. So this is literally the authentic sound of the M1. This is coming from the Korg M1, which is, it's a classic 90s keyboard, you know, and this is something else I've written about. You look on the Point Blank blog, you'll see an article all about the M1, you know, so the, the classic sound of the M1 organ. This is a preset called Organ 2. And, uh, you know, the texture of that is just, it, it's a real specific sound, you know, and so, that's the best device to use for that. I've got another organ. This is like three of them together. So I'll bring the, uh, the mid one in. So obviously it's higher in pitch. You know, if I was gonna play a similar riff at the same octave, it might end up messy. So this is a deliberate thing. You know, I, I literally thought to myself, let's keep it simple, let's keep it clean. One organ for the lower octave, a mid organ for the octave up and so that's allowing them to sit together. Now there's also a solo. So this organ here is a different preset. So I'll show you this. This is the BX100, so there's a, a very different tone to this organ. If I take away these, just solo on this one, and you can see the chain that I've got here, so it's going through a ping pong delay, there's an EQ to thin the sound out, Another EQ for a little bit more tone shaping on there. Going through an auto pan to create a little bit of movement left and right. You'll also notice that there's a utility there. Now, when I'm working a lot of the time, because I'm trying to do stuff quickly, what I find sometimes is that my fader uh, is possibly too loud and I can't go any louder. So if I need a little bit more gain, what I'll do is I'll slip on the utility at the end there. So I'm getting a little bit of extra level. That's the only reason for that there. So the solo is quite funny actually. Um, the tune itself was done, I think it was probably about eight o'clock in the morning or something. It was one of those early kind of vibes and I had literally my laptop in my lap and so I didn't have a MIDI keyboard connected at all. It was literally me tapping out on the QWERTY keyboard on the laptop. So the solo, you might think it was played by someone who knows what they're doing, but uh, <laughs> I've got no idea what the notes are that I was actually triggering from the laptop. It was just a few letters that sounded good, you know, when I was actually playing it. So what I'll do is I'll do a little simulation. Let's get the octave right. So that's what I was doing, you know, tapping away on top. And uh, I picked the best bits, basically edited and quantized stuff. I'll bring up the notes so you can see these. So what I did actually was a long solo. I didn't actually do little loops. It wasn't, you know, let me do a four bar chunk or an eight bar chunk. I literally deliberately put a performance in there so you can see it does evolve and it does go on, but I input the notes on the QWERTY keyboard. So it just goes to show you don't need loads and loads of different bits of gear or hardware keyboards. You can do a lot. This whole tune was created on the laptop on the QWERTY keyboard. So you can hear the whole track's kind of developing in terms of a structure. It's a gradual build. And the tension is there from the organ solo kind of increasing in intensity. You start to see certain patterns that are emerging. You know, the fact the tambourine comes in for a period of time and then goes away and then comes back. So we're leading up to this period where there's a little bit of a difference. It's almost like a little mini crescendo. And uh, funny enough, uh, the vocals are me. Uh, I do actually do quite a lot of vocal work on my tunes, so that's just, that's about, I'll take it back, I'll show you. It's quite funny when you listen to isolation. 
So there's about 10 of me. Uh, kind of mad mystic monk kind of vibe uh, going on there. <laughs> and uh, uh, that's just basically a whole load of the same thing being performed and then panned and EQ'd and separated. So there's tons of that. And uh, I just wanted to get a little bit of a vibe down there instead of using a sample. But once again, we've gone to like a middle section. It's a, a lot of tunes, you get this sort of gradual build and then maybe two thirds of the way in, there's a breakdown. So it's a real nice, simple structure, taking it back. Exactly the same organ solo is there, which is a bit sort of like a cheat, really. But what I did was I changed the position relative to the bars um, to get how you had it before. So it feels like it's a little bit different. You know, so it's got a different vibe, but it's exactly the same. So we're building up again. And you can see it's actually a very simple tune. If I minimise this lot, yeah, there's, there's actually hardly any tracks there, really, if you think about it. Some people spend lots of time layering loads and loads of tracks together. There's not actually that much here. So we're bringing back the mid layer organ here, which was missing. So it's a different order, whereas before the mid organ was there before the solo, so we switched it around. It just shows you can get a lot of mileage out of uh, a very small amount of ingredients as well. You know, that's the whole thing with this. Now we're sort of building up to a section where some new stuff comes in. I'll shut up when the brass comes in. That's a sample, some of you might recognise that, it's an old funk tune. Um, so the brass stab in there is a sample. The string is a real example of tension that's been used on so many tunes, you know. Basically a sustained single note. This is the, uh, the trusty M1 again, the strings patch, which was used on a lot of productions over the years. Okay, let me just do something here. Got a little technical thing here. I'm going to turn off the audio. So hopefully you all can hear that still. So back onto the string. So we've got the string is creating the tension. The brass, you know, these are new elements basically. Kind of building up to, to the end of the tune. You know, these new bits on there. Cut it completely. Cut it completely. Okay, just give me a sec. Talking about tension. We've got some. So you want me to take capture audio off and try it. Okay, so we're back. I don't know what happened there. Some little technical things. Probably my, it's my fault, really. <laughs> uh, so we're going to go in here now. Back again. So we're talking about tension. High string, yeah. sustained string sound coming from the M1. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, the brass was a sample. So we're really building up towards the end here. New elements about to start coming in. So this is the um, the brass. You can see this is automated here. Once again, another M1 track. So yeah, for me, this tune is actually a tribute to the sound of the 90s. Um, you know, I used to go to the Ministry of Sound, you know, the the box, the main room, a lot in the, the mid 90s. And so this whole tune was like a kind of a tribute to that that sound. So that's why the M1 is all over it. So this brass sound, sort of sound you would have heard a lot of uh, Morales, David Morales and uh, Frankie Knuckles sort of productions back in the day. Everyone was using the same gear, you know, almost every studio you went in you'd find the M1. So really stripping it down, brass is being filtered, you can see the auto filter here taking away the highs and the mids, putting the mad monks right at the foreground. <laughs> And some real sparseness, you know, that's one of the things that I remember back in the day in the box. You know, you could have like that main room with like pretty much nothing other than a stab sound or a, a, even a hi-hat. I remember like a hi-hat for about two minutes just being worked by the DJ and then, you know, everything kicking back. So there's a real sense of scale and sort of, you know, space on a big system when you've got that real sparse, minimal texture where everything kicks back. You don't have to have big dramatic snare rolls or builds or anything it's just pure simple kind of club stuff so that's it really um dj outro really simple organ bass carrying on and then we're gonna basically drop out the beats 
and the brass elements. If you want to check out my master chain, a lot of people are curious about this. This is one of my master chains. So I've got a gain plug in at first on the left hand side and that's basically just to give me the ability to shift the complete volume of the track down or up before it hits the mastering processes. I've got a compressor here set to RMS. My attack is 31.1 milliseconds. My release is quite fast at 66, ratio 1.4 to 1. I'm using this to just kind of bind the mix together a bit. All right, and I'll show you if we take a section come back where it's quite busy. Let's see what it sounds like without that compressor. It kind of makes it bounce a little bit, it pulls some of the elements together a bit more. There is an EQ here with basically um, a little tour of this. I've got 80 hertz low shelf. I've just boosted 1.4 dBs, just a little bit to warm out the bass. The uh, second one is, um, this is a parametric band, 196, just 1.48 cut. So just to take a little bit of muddiness out. Um, what have I got going on here? Very slight increase, uh, decrease at 2.15K, tiny. Um, and then at four, I've got basically a little bit of a boost at 12.9K, and that's on uh, a parametric band. So this is just to kind of sweeten it up. I'll take this off. Kind of sort of polishes it, makes it feel a little bit better, a little bit nicer. And then finally the limiter. And I've used the gain here to push into that. So I'm not really getting too much reduction here. It's about minus three at the most. Um, yeah, about minus three on there. So that's making sure it's nice and loud. You know, it's going to compete against other tunes in a club. So that's what's going on with that. Um, so I'm just going to find out if any of you guys have got any questions. If there's anything specifically you want me to uh, go over on this, we've got um, we've got a couple of questions. Um, Andre, I think wanted to know a bit more about how the master classes work. Uh, hi, Andre. Thanks for getting in touch. Um, I think we actually spoke on the phone the other day. Um, so yeah, nice to have you with us. Um, the master classes are um, usually on a Thursday evening. Uh, we schedule them here in London between kind of nine and eleven in the evening. Um, and one of the reasons we do that is because it works uh, really well for our students in the US. We've got quite a big following in the US. Um, so yeah, if you're watching in the US, hi. Howdy. <laughs> uh, howdy. Nice to have you with us. Um, yeah, so one of the reasons we do them at that time is because it works well for the US students. So um, Andre, if I remember rightly, you're in New York, uh, in which case uh, that would be kind of early evening for you. Um, and if you're uh, on the West Coast, it kind of works out around lunchtime. So that's one of the reasons why we do that. Um, we do try to be flexible though. So um, because you're in a relatively small class uh, and you've got this kind of one-to-one -one contact with your tutor, if the, the master class time isn't going to work for you, let us know and we can, you know, we can, make, uh, we can make changes. Um, you know, the most important thing obviously is that it works for you guys. So you know, we try to be flexible where we can you know, tell us what you need in terms of timings and we'll, we'll do our best to help. Um, so yeah, the masterclass is once a week, usually on a Thursday, um, lasts for about an hour. Yeah. Um, and I mean, on the more advanced classes that we teach, so things like uh, maybe mixing dance music, if you've checked that course out, um, what you might be seeing in that demonstration would be something like perhaps what you've just been watching with Danny. Um, I mean, bear in mind, that's obviously a, a complete track. So if you're new to this, if you're a beginner and that's looking a little kind of daunting, don't worry because, um, you know, the idea of the courses is to get you to that point. Um, but bear in mind, we teach lots and lots of beginners and we start at a very kind of elementary level. Um, so, you know, bear in mind that, you know, Danny's been making music professionally for probably longer than he cares to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, a long time, you know, that's, that's kind of 20 years of studio experience you're looking at there. So what we're trying to do with the courses is condense all of that experience down into a, the shortest time possible um, so that you guys don't have to figure it all out for yourself and you don't have to have that really frustrating experience of, you know, sitting in front of a computer just, you know, banging your head against a brick wall thinking, well, you know, I know what I want to hear and I know the kind of records that I want to emulate 
Um, I just don't have the skills to do it. The whole purpose of these courses is to break that process down and show you how those effects are achieved, you know, how you get to that point. So, um, yeah, do bear that in mind as, as well. You know, this is, um, that track's um, obviously, as I say, a complete track. You know, you're at a, a pretty advanced level at this point. So that's the kind of finished product that we're aiming to get you to. Um, the only other people I can see online at the moment are AXM Music, who, again, I think I've been in email contact with. So, hi, how you doing? Um, if you do have any questions, um, get in touch, let us know. I'll just refresh this quickly now and see if there's anyone else with a question. Doesn't look like there is at the moment. Um, but yeah, anything you want to know um, about the courses, about the way they work, about the range of courses that we do, um, you know, we can talk about all of those things. It's, uh, it's all driven by you. So if you've got a question, uh, holler and let us know. All right. Um, Shall I go through... Um like a kind of weekly, a typical weekly structure. That's, that's a good idea, yeah. I think yeah. that was that would be a useful So, um, you know, I mean, David's talking about this whole thing about, you know, this this is the finished product, you know, so I was saying earlier that this is the sort of thing you might be looking at at the end of the course, you know, in terms of, you know, getting your structure and everything sorted out. But um, obviously you have to start somewhere. So, you know, in the first week of our pro producer courses, what we tend to do is to focus on beats, you know, so getting the beats right for the start of music that you're making. So we would give you a, a selection of videos, you know, it is, is usually about an hour, sometimes more of content in that first week, which will be focused on programming drums. Always trying to get the sounds right for the particular style, and if there's a, a diverse range of subgenres, we'll attempt to cover those. And so it's designed to make you um, be able to sort of make a decision for yourselves about the kind of vibe that you're going for. You know, we're not trying to say, this is exactly how this style is. We try to present a broad range of textures and approaches so that you can make your own mind up about what you're going to do and then kind of choose the direction you're going to head in. So we want you guys to sort of experience different ways of doing stuff and then try to get your own sound, you know, which is the, the whole kind of vibe here. Um, that's, got a question? Yeah, that's, a question. that's quite a common question that we get on the, the course advice team as well. Um, and I think, you know, Danny summed it up there quite well. I think the purpose of these courses is not to give you a sort of a step-by-step -step recipe that you follow each week, because um, that would obviously just take all the creativity out of this. Um, you know, what we're trying to do is demonstrate some techniques and some processes that, you know, pro producers use, but that you can um, take inspiration from. So a lot of the material that you see in the course is kind of designed to be a sort of start point, really, and inspire you, you know, to go off and do your thing. Um, so, yeah, what, what we don't want to do is, um, you know, as I say, just give you a recipe to follow because that would mean that when the tutor sits down to look at your assignments each week, you basically have 10 assignments that sound exactly the same. Now, thankfully, that never happens um, because people do, you know, take the materials in the course and do their own thing with them. Um, there was one question I wanted to respond to as well, which was uh, Alex uh, was asking about third party plugins. Um, what you tend to find on these courses is we we tend to focus on the sort of uh, the instruments and the plugins that are native to, to Ableton or to Logic. Um, the reason we do that is because um, obviously everyone's got their, their own favourite plugins, their own favourite synths, and you know that kind of thing. And obviously we can't uh, we can't incorporate all of them. Um, so what we do is we try and teach you the kind of core skills on um, the instruments and effects that everyone's got within Logic or within Ableton. Obviously, those skills are transferable. So, if you do something like a sound design class, all the material that you learn there about, you know, synthesis and sampling and getting really creative with building your own um, sounds, that's those are all transferable skills. You know, you can apply those to uh, to massive or to silence, which you saw earlier, or whatever you know, whatever kind of synth you're working with. Would you go along with that? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, and you know, the M1 example that I've got here. Um, because I really wanted to bring that into one of the courses, what I did on the Ableton Deep House course was to actually sample an M1 and turn it into an instrument. So we've got like a virtual copy of the M1 that you can use and I actually show you how to do that as well. So we went through the whole process of getting the M1 plug in the demo version and then recording note by note long notes that then could be put into a sampler. So you've got like a kind of virtual copy of the M1. So that's one of the approaches that we used there. Um, so, you know, it, I know that a lot of people do like to, they have sort of 
forming their own ideas about their favorite plugins and stuff like that. It's almost like if you take a musician and take them into a record shop, uh, a guitar shop, you know, that they would pick a certain guitar that they like the sound of. You know, everybody's going to start forming their ideas about the, the synths that they start you know, enjoying using. But we have to be relatively neutral um, on the courses. We've got a couple of courses where we have third party stuff. Um, on the dubstep course, for example, we've got Massive featured. And um, I'm trying to think of another one, actually. I think that's it, isn't it? Have we got another one? Oh, yeah. In the Native Instruments sound design course, we've got Reactor and also Contact. You know, so they're very key parts of that particular course. And um, Oh, yeah, Waves as well, yeah. So on the mastering course, we've got the Waves plugins. So, you know, it's, it's important to acknowledge that people do use them. But there's a lot of core skills that you can learn on the actual plugins that you get within you know, Logic or Cubase or Ableton. So, yeah, I mean, Alex has come back with a, a sort of follow up to, to that question. Um, in, I guess that the tutors wouldn't necessarily have access to every plugin that you, you guys use, because obviously there's so many out there. And as I said, everyone's got their favorites. So, yeah, generally we would focus on the, um, on the, the kind of native ones in, in Logic or Ableton. Um, if you if you feel like it's a really sort of and hopefully Danny will back me up on this if you feel like it's a really integral part of your track that you have to use this particular kind of plugin um, then you know you can uh, it would just mean bouncing that particular track down as audio yeah um, I mean I would always say that if you're going to do that you're going to be missing out on some potential feedback because if all I could deal with is your audio file and maybe I needed to tweak the envelope shape or change the modulation these things I can't get access to that so mm -hmm. you're missing out and I'm missing out you know so really it's better to try to keep all these things within the native plugins or the plugins that are featured on the course I, yeah I'd, I'd agree with that and I think it's um, returning to what we were talking about earlier it improves your understanding as well because if you've got a um, it gives you more of an insight into sort of why you're doing what you're doing and you know um, as Danny said if he can see all the individual settings within that plug and it means he can give you much more detailed feedback than if he's just listening to an audio track where you're basically just hearing the effect that the plugin has. And it's also the, the other guys in your class as well, because everybody's encouraged to download each other's projects and also view each other's DVRs as well. So then everybody can see the settings that everybody's been using as well. You know, so it opens up everything. You know. So DVR, for those of you that haven't um, sort of checked out, uh, checked it out on the website, is what we call um, the one-to-one the -one feedback. It's direct video response which basically means that you know, each week you're getting a direct response um, from your tutor to a track that you've uploaded, and that's basically like a tutorial video. Um, Andre's got a question, which is, um, what VSTs do you recommend for getting a classic Detroit minimal techno pad or synth sound? So I'm going to pass you over to the expert for that one. <laughs> uh, um, um, well, uh, to be honest with you, I, I think you could get a nice kind of sound using you know, the analog synth inside, um, Ableton, you know, it, you could do so with, uh, it depends what platform you're on, you know, Logic, ES2. I mean, a lot of the time when it comes to these sort of Detroit type stabs, it's more about the notes that are being used more so necessarily than the actual sound itself. I mean, a lot of the time it's, it's a sawtooth used with some kind of effects, maybe some reverb or maybe slightly rougher texture added through some distortion. Uh, it's the notes, you know, like things like these like seventh chords where you know, you've got several chords, uh, notes playing together that are then shifted up in a parallel fashion. Because a lot of guys use the sample chords. So that means there'd be, say, five or six notes in the chord. And they'd sample that as a complete whole, map that onto a keyboard. And then it gets transposed up and down the, you know, the actual keyboard itself. And in something like Ableton, you know, you've got the ability to use a, a device like a, a MIDI device so that for every one note you hold down, there are multiple notes that are created. And so if you want a Detroit type stab, you would have literally on something like Ableton, you'd have the MIDI device chord set up so that it would play five or six notes, running to a sawtooth with some reverb or something, you know, something like that could work. Um, if you want, I could maybe do a demo if, uh, if we've got time. Yeah. Could have a look at that. Oh, well, it, while Danny's sort of doing some setup on, yeah, the, on the computer, then, there's a couple of other, other questions that, that have come in. Um, so someone asked, uh, I'm not going to try and pronounce your username because I'll get it wrong. Um, are you guys up to the challenge of making a producer out of a complete beginner with no previous uh, producing experience? Has this been done before? Um, it's, 
it's, it's what we do, <laughs> essentially. I mean, a lot of the people who, who learn with us are complete beginners. So they're coming to this completely fresh. They've not used any of the software before. Um, in the first instance, I'll try and be as helpful as I can in terms of making sure that you know you make the right choice for software that's going to work for you. Um, you don't need to spend a fortune on equipment these days. You know, if you get the if you get the software right, you need a pretty sort of minimal amount of equipment to sort of set yourself up as a producer these days. Um, so yeah, we work with lots of beginners. Um, I would say. As I sort of referred to earlier on, um, the process of learning with a with um, point blank can make the process a lot shorter. So we can get you there a lot quicker than you know trying to teach yourself or teaching yourself from books or manuals or um, you know YouTube tutorials or that kind of thing. Um, that's not to say that it happens overnight. You know you do need to put in the practice. Um, so if you want to get to a stage where your your tunes are kind of release quality. Um, and you know DJ is going to play them and labels are going to sign them um, then that is going to take a little while but yeah certainly you know we can we can get you to that point um, everyone that teaches here is a pro producer and those guys are all here to, to help you and to give you sort of as I said weekly feedback on your tracks so yeah I, I think uh, you know we can we can definitely help and we work with a lot of um, a lot of beginners um, so hopefully that answers the question if it doesn't then uh, hit me back in yeah, I mean that's another thing we should mention. If you want to see some of the students that have gone from beginner to uh, to you know having some degree of success in the music industry, you can find some examples on on our website. Um, if you head to student success, uh, you'll find a few of them on there. Um, I, I don't know what kind of music, what sort of style of music you're interested in, but there's producers doing you know everything from house to kind of you know dubstep to um, you know kind of techno that have, that have had uh, tracks released off the back of the course. We've even had contact with a few students who've actually had tracks that were made on the course released um, subsequently. So, you know, that happens as well. So, um, yeah, check out some of the student success stories on the on the website. Um, there's also, for those of you that don't know, there's a point blank record label. Um, so if you head to iTunes or you head to Beatport, you can hear some of the student music on there. Um, we also do regular podcasts that features uh, sometimes uh, tutors music and students music that kind of thing so yeah there's there's lots of places you can kind of get to hear about some of the uh, success stories off the back of the college um, the blogs also a great place to do that um, so there's a blog on the website if you're interested in the latest student success stories or um, you know internships or remix contests or guest lectures or these kind of live broadcasts that we sometimes do with professional producers the, the blog is a great place to learn about all of that kind of stuff because there's, there's there's always lots more going on besides just the, the classes every week um how are you getting on danny yeah well i'm ready okay yeah um so what i've done is i've just set up an 808 kit with a very simplistic beat on it and uh, that's just as a backing and i've also now got the analog synth now you could have any virtual analog synth. You know, all I'm doing here is I'm gonna have a sawtooth and I'm gonna shape it. I'll put a filter and stuff on and some effects. But uh, what I wanna do is just to try and uh, show you this concept of the multiple note thing from one finger. So at the moment, I've got these uh, just single notes that are playing. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to go to the MIDI effects and uh, hopefully you guys can see this now. And you can see that we've got a device called Chord. Now, what I can do I'm going to drag it so that you can see what's happening with this. If I drag it, it's going to go to the left of the instrument that I've got loaded. Now, I could have double clicked that, but I just wanted to show you that it literally sits in front. So it's, it's to the left hand side. Now, for every note that I trigger, I can also have additional notes. I can have up to six additional notes coming through. I'm just going to turn this up my side a bit. So, look, I'll show you. If I do maybe over here, let's do five maybe. So you can hear there's now there's two notes that are occurring instead of uh, what I had before. So we go up maybe a couple more. So we're starting to form a chord from a single note. You know this is what's happening. So before I do anything else, what I'm doing I'll see how it sounds with the filter on it. So I'm going to turn on the filter. I'm going to bring the cutoff frequency down a bit. Just a little touch of resonance. Take the envelope amount up. So you can hear now that it's got a bright start, but then goes warm over time. 
and the time it takes to come down in terms of the frequency is a decay. So we're getting this nice kind of sharp kind of texture there. So what I'll do, just to give it a little sense of space, I'm going to stick a, an effect on there. So you're going to come here, stick the reverb on. With the minimal stuff, you often get some long decays. So you get a real nice kind of spacious vibe, and that'd be automated. So if I put a beat on, So what I do, I record something in and then I'll start shaping the sound a little bit more. So I'm going to record in a little, real basic little thing. So here we go. Just going to set the, um, the loop all right on here. So I'm going to do this. Just going to quantize as well. Just going to pick the best one. I think it was here. All right, that was here. Okay, so I've got it looping now. So remember I said about the whole thing about the reverb. So that sort of thing could be automated to give you some extra kind of vibes. It's actually quite hard for me because it's quite quiet. So I'm just going to try and turn it up a bit. I don't want to spill too much through to the mic. So you've got that sound at the moment. So now I was talking about adding some more notes. We can go over here. So start to form some different textures. It start to become more of a chord. There's different numbers that we could try. You can obviously hear when certain sounds working better than others. You know, our ears are sort of tuned into notes that are going to work and not, you know, so some of these are working nicely, like that. Sounds wrong. All right, you can really hear that as it's being transposed up and down. So you don't, you don't actually have, you don't have to have musical knowledge. It's just a ba basically a case of, does it sound good or bad? That sounds bad. So you can move it up to the next one. That's working a lot better. And we can have up to six additional notes. You can even go lower as well, which can actually work quite nicely sometimes. So we go just up a bit. So you get a real sense of almost like a kind of bass flavor in there now, which is working really nicely. And what I could do is take the envelope amount down more. So it's not so bright and obvious now. You know, so there's tons of options here with you know, shaping the sound. Lots of possibilities, and then like a big splash. So we start to get that nice kind of futuristic flavor in there. Obviously, you know, you'd start building up your other track elements around it. You can make it sound a little bit harsher. Um, you know, maybe you'd want to get something. Um, let's go for something that's going to really bring out some sort of buzzy kind of texture. If I went to, for example, the erosion, which is a nice little plug-in and the sign. So it's giving it this kind of almost like a lo-fi kind of sample, you know, taking like the sample rate bit depth down kind of a vibe. And you can even use this. I'll tell you what I would do. I'd stick this to the left of the reverb. And then what I'd do is I'd set it up so that I can adjust this as part of the tune. But then I'd get that mapped as well. Let me just show you with this. We didn't have that as part of the evolution of the track. You know, we could just map some controls. And you know, when it comes to electronic music, a lot of the time it's not so much about a, a complex composition with the musical side. It's more about what you're doing with the effects and the processing to allow the track to evolve. And so, you know, something that, as simple as this little setup could actually prove to be quite diverse in terms of the possibilities of the sound. And you know, on the, for example, the, the sound design course, the Ableton sound design course, we build a lot of custom instrument racks. You know, so we'd start off maybe, maybe with something like this, we turn it into a group. So I'm right clicking with all of these selected. And that now becomes a new custom instrument that I can save. And I can also take everything away 
and just leave us with eight rotary controls. And I can map these to any of the instruments contained within. So that's the kind of stuff that we cover building these complex instrument chains that give us a very distinct end result. And so you see all the steps about building it, why you're doing everything, you know, it's not just parrot fashion. We're showing you the reasons why you're doing what you're doing, all of those steps. And you're gonna end up with a collection of custom instruments that you can use on your own productions. You know, that's at least one aspect of it. Then you can customize them. So we're seeing students customizing these, sharing them amongst each other in the classroom. So you know, you've got lots of possibilities basically. So hopefully that's you know, the kind of vibe that you were talking about. Um, there's tons of possibilities, you know, tons of possibilities. So that was basically in response to the, the question that Andre asked about a sort of Detroit minimal kind of techno vibe. Um, Andre's got another question, but I'm just gonna kind of leap forward to um, a question from AXM Music, just so that everyone gets a chance to sort of pitch in and ask. Uh, he says, um, I use an awkward setup of Reason rewired into Cubase uh, with Waves plugins. How would that work when you're going over with me, with me in the course? Um, I mean, I can answer that, but if you wanna. Well, I mean, you know, the thing is, is that some of the, the tutors are gonna have a lot of stuff installed on their hard disks. You know, it depends on the tutor. Some guys might have all, everything that you've got, um, but you can't guarantee that, that's the problem. So mm. it maybe you'd have to bounce everything out as stems, um, you know, send them to the tutor. Um, but once again, we're coming back to that whole thing about you're going to miss out on some of the tips, you know, the ability yeah. to tweak things at such a minute detail. That's one of the real key things for me, you know, about this. I, I wish I had this stuff when I was younger because I could have learned a lot quicker. You know, having somebody getting in there and saying, no, actually, if this is what you're trying to achieve, you need to just tweak this here, this one here, just maybe you're three parameters away from the result that you want, but you can't, <laughs> you can't see that happening because it's just an audio file. You know, that's, that's, the, that's the scenario. Um, I mean, just to sort of follow up a little bit on that question as well, I mean, we do, we do teach on Cubase, um, so we can certainly give you some, I guess the, the answer to that question depends on the course that you, that you wanted to do. If you're looking at something like, um, you know, mixing or mastering, certainly the mastering course refers to the Waves plugins. So if you need some feedback on how to get the most out of those, then take a look at the mastering course because you'll find some great stuff on there. Um, that course has been developed with some real kind of uh, expert mastering engineers. Um, Cubase, we also offer courses on. So again, we can give you some direct feedback on how to get the most out of Cubase and how you use Cubase. The only part of that question that's not really supported at the moment is Reason. We don't really do any courses on Reason. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, we could. It'd be good to find out a bit more about what aspects you know you you really want to focus on and which areas of your production you feel like you need to work on. If it's mixing or you know the, the sort of latter stages, then we can we can probably help. But if uh, if you're looking for tips on how you use Reason, it's not really something we uh, we have a specific course for at the moment. Um, and then Andre had a couple of questions as well about um, specifically about kind of mixing and mastering. He says. Um, I've got a drum and bass background, however I don't believe in that kind of over compressed uh, method and prefer a more organic kind of approach to drums. How would you sort of go about sweetening the sound without kind of over compressing or over, over cooking the compression? Well I mean, you know, the thing is with the compressor is you're just changing the whole volume aspect of the sound, you know, so when you have breaks and, um, you know, I mean, a lot of people if they're teaching compression would sort of go to a break beat and use it as a deliberate tool to add extra noise and texture. So if you're doing that with a break, you would be compressing quite heavily. You'd be doing things like taking the release really quick so it sort of brings up all the space between the beats. So it's all about the settings on the compressor really. I mean, when you've got a beat, you can compress it so that it sounds like it's really in your face or you can compress it so it sounds more natural. It's not just about that because there's tons of other aspects as well. It's the individual sounds that you're using, the types of sounds that you're using on your programming, um, the effects processes that you're using. I mean, at the end of the day, the permutations are extremely vast, but I would say to you that if you're on a mixing course, the, the guy that you're working with will have enough experience to be able to sort of treat the drums as you want, you know, because mix engineers will be used to dealing with a client who says, okay, I want that really heavily compressed sound or I want this to be subtle. You know, it's up to you, the kind of flavor that you want to pursue. You just need to communicate with your tutor. So there's tons of, tons of ways to process a break or even a programmed drum loop. Um, it's, it's down to you just to talk to your tutor to say the kind of vibe that you want. You know. 
And brief follow up on that as well, also from Andre, he said uh, there is this idea that you should not mix and master your own music. Just wonder what your... My, my personal feeling about that, um, I wouldn't listen to me um, because, <laughs> uh, because I, I actually do everything. I, I mix and master as I go. Um, and uh, the only reason why I, I feel comfortable with that is because I've been doing it for so long. Um, I wouldn't recommend it to anybody when you're starting out. Um, one of the things that I've been lucky to do over the years is that I've been in, basically sat in mastering studios with mastering engineers and I've seen my tracks EQ'd, compressed, I've sat, I've asked as many questions as I could. Initially I didn't understand what on earth they were saying but gradually over time I understood more and I saw so many of my tunes being mastered and actually cut which is an amazing experience as well with the vinyl being you know the, the lathe cutting this and you could hear it and see it. It's, amazing experience so you know I've, I've been through all of that I've seen you know the vinyl mastering I've seen digital mastering and so I understand the, the reasons behind things that are going on I personally feel happy doing the mixing and the mastering I what I tend to do like for example the tune the box that I played to you earlier I was literally mixing and mastering almost from the first 10 minutes you know so I was I for me I like things to sound polished as early as possible because if they don't I get that sort of motivational sticking point. So I get to the point, oh, I can't be bothered anymore, you know. I, I can't see past this sort of barrier of, of poor quality. So I always try to get things sounding great. And I, I tend to sort of mix as I go, i.e. if I've already got a, a sound down, I take the new sound and put it on and try to get that fitting what's, what, with what's already there. You know, it kind of makes the job easier in a way. So I've got less things I have to think about. So I'm mixing and I'm mastering as I go, but I'm very, very careful that I check back on my master all the time. I make sure I'm not pushing too hard into the compressor. I'm not pushing too hard into the limiter. I'm constantly evaluating what's going on. If we go back to um, the box. So I've just uh, got rid of that project. <laughs> I'm terrible, I'm like that. A lot of people save everything they do, but I, I don't know, I've got this kind of sadistic thing, this streak in me that I like to just forget and wipe everything. Um, I, I don't know what it is, it's really weird. So someone could have said, yeah, save that and use it for yourself, but I didn't. Um, so over here, if I was pushing too hard into my compressor, which then in turn is obviously going into the limiter, I can use my gain on the left hand side, that was the whole point in having that as the first item on the chain. So when I'm working, if I'm adding new elements to the track and my level is going up, because that's what happens, then I can just bring the gain down before it hits everything on the master there. So if you guys are the type of guys who want to do that as you go, that's the, the, the caution that you can put in and, and give yourself a little safety net. So yeah, I mean personally, I like to do it, um, others would say no. <laughs> Um, one of the other questions that came in from Alex was um, about the one-to-one the -one sessions. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we, we call them DVRs, uh, which is direct video response. And it's essentially a one-to-one a -one tutorial. So what you can expect is, yeah, I guess it's broadly similar to, to what Danny was doing earlier on with this, this track, The Box. So it's basically taking the project that you've uh, uploaded that you've submitted to us and then just basically deconstructing it in front of you as a sort of um, you know a one-to-one -one tutorial video so your tutor would basically open up the project open up the individual tracks um, you know open up your, your your master if you're at the stage where you've, you've got all that in place as well and just basically pick it apart um, give you some feedback on um, you know everything from the drum programming to the mixing to you know whatever aspect it is um, that you know we need to focus on. Yeah, well, one of the things that I was going to say about the DVR is that because everybody's coming from so many different directions musically, um, what we always recommend you to do is to provide links of the kind of stuff that you like. So when it comes to the assignment page, it will say to you, well, you know, you're going to submit some drums this week, but give us some examples of the kind of producers that you're into. What kind of drum sounds do you like? And then your tutor will basically go through the links, often in front of you, so they'll be recording, you know, they're going through YouTube or SoundCloud, any of these links that you're providing. They'll have a listen, get a bearing on the texture of the sound that you want to make, and then the DVR is 
basically guided towards that sound, you know, using their experience, you know, trying to get you to achieve something similar to the kind of vibe that you want to go for. Because, you know, if you have a style of music like Deep House, there's so many different interpretations of the genre name that in a class you might have lots of people into things that, you know, you, you might not agree that it's Deep House even, you know, but it's the diversity. You give us the links of the tracks that you like. We have a listen. When we do your review, we're just thinking about that kind of sound in the back of our minds to, to try to help you get that kind of effect. Okay, um, I'm kind of clock watching a little bit and it looks like we've got about five minutes five left. Minutes, yeah. So um, yeah, if you've got any kind of questions that you wanted to, to get into to sort of wrap up before we finish this, this live session, then um, yeah, just uh, post them in the comments section and we'll do our best to tackle them in the next five minutes. Um, if you miss out or if you're watching this, um, after the live broadcast, then don't forget you can contact us um, pretty much seven days a week via the website. Um, I'm available on email. You can just email um, advice at pointblankonline.net and that will find its way to me. Um, there's also a team of people that are here to advise on, on courses. So if you're watching this broadcast sort of after the event and it's throwing up questions that you want to ask about the courses, then you know don't hesitate, get in touch. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Um, what else can I tell you? You can call us as well if you want to speak to a real pe person on a uh, on a real telephone. Then you know there's, <laughs> there's people here you can speak to. Um, if you prefer to get in touch via email, you can. There's also a live chat system which we've got on the on the website as well. So, you know, if you're uh, if you're on your lunch <coughs> break at work and you suddenly want to kind of just find out a bit more about what we do, you can just open up the live chat function and. Um, you know, give us a shout on there. You've got Facebook, Twitter, Facebook, as Twitter, well. yeah. yeah. We're, we're everywhere you expect us to be, basically. But um, yeah, we'd, we'd love we'd love to hear from you. So um, you know, if you've if you've got any questions related to the courses and what we do, um, you know, just ask, basically. Um, <laughs> Andre's back in with. Uh, can you explain si Can you explain side chaining in brief detail? All right. Well, all right. The, the quickest and easiest way to do that, right, is you listen to the radio and uh, the DJ is playing some music, and then what they do is they talk, and then the music gets turned down when they're speaking, and when they stop speaking, the music gets turned back up, right? So it's a, a box that sits in the radio, and it's done automatically, so that's basically responding to the volume. So when the guy's speaking, music's turned down when he stops. So if you're talking about something like a, a kick drum, and a, a long sound, like a sustained sound, or a bass sound, Whenever the kick drum plays, the bass sound is being turned down, and then when the kick stops, the bass comes back up again. That's, that's all sidechaining is. I mean, the, the technical word sidechain comes from basically a compressor, a hardware compressor would have a physical socket around the back, and so you would feed signal from the desk that had the kick on it into the back of the compressor. So you're having a side input into the compressor. That's what's going on. So that's where the, the technique comes from. I mean, we used to call it ducking, um, that was like a name for it, but you use, you know, you cr create the ducking effect through the side chain. These days, a lot of people just say side chaining for that sort of pumping sound. So it's a sound going quiet and then louder. That's that's what side chaining is. What's uh, that? And that's dealt with on specific courses, isn't it? I mean, something we'd look at on the mixing. Yeah, dance I mean, you'd, course. See it, you'd see it on a variety of our courses. Yeah, you know, presented in a different way according to the style of music. Very. I mean, obviously, it's a very common technique these days in all sorts of music, from you know, from drum and bass through to you know, there's, there's lots of house tracks that use it. So, I guess on the pro producer courses, we put it in the context of that particular style. There's lots of different ways you could use that. Uh, right. Let's just see if there's any final. Just questions. a quick one. I just saw about Andre. He's talking about the Detroit stab in yeah. Logic. Um, the chord memorizer can do the same job, and um, you know it's it's very similar. It's just actually presented in a different way. So you can learn how to do that from your tutor if you are actually on a Logic course. So you can do the one finger chord Detroit style. It's easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, the only other question I haven't answered so far is a techie one, uh, which again was from Alex. Uh, it sounds like he's got about four hundred pounds to spend, and wants to know whether he should get a virus snow or a virus bee. <laughs> virus snow looks nice. It's white, isn't it? <laughs> sounds like it. Probably I'd go. Could I'd be. go with the aesthetic kind of vibe. I think <laughs> on that. Um, yeah. To be honest with you, I don't know um, either of those synths intimately enough to tell you what's the difference um, between the two. I, as far as I'm concerned, anybody who talks about a virus says it's good. I don't think mm. there is a bad virus. <laughs> for a cold or a flu it's just <laughs> yeah i'll get my coat now um so <laughs> basically I, for me i'd go for the white one i like it right. <laughs> yeah. 
There you go. That's a pretty. That's an expert opinion for you, right there. <laughs> uh, right, we're about to finish up, I think, uh, and I don't think there's any more questions that have come in, in the last couple of minutes. So um, yeah, those of you, those of you that have been watching uh, live online, um, thanks a lot for coming along. I hope that's answered some of your questions and given you a, uh, a clearer insight into what we do. Um, like I said before, if you've got any other questions, um, feel free to get in touch via email. Uh, via live chat on the website, uh, give us a call, we'd love to talk to you. Um, you can even post questions on Facebook and Twitter if you want to and, and we know we'll aim to get back to you as quick as we can. But um, yeah, uh, we'll do another one of these pretty soon I think, so you'll get to hear about that on the website um, and probably also via the methods that I talked about, Facebook and Twitter and so on. So um, yeah, if you've got questions come along and join us next time and um, yeah, thanks a lot for uh, joining us. Yep. See you soon. Yeah. <laughs>